Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. This is our second session on uh, Imam Ghazali's uh, book on the effort al lisan the pitfalls, the defects of the tongue. And uh, yesterday afternoon we were looking at the first two items from the list of 20 defects which he identifies pertaining to the human quality of speech. We saw how he began with really a kind of glorification of this divine gift, how it in a sense outstrips and outsmarts the, the senses even and defines us as human beings. We are entities that articulate and the divine communication to us in its most perfect form is in the form of articulate speech. And the first of these uh, uh, 20 turned out to be uh, the need to avoid speaking about what is none of our business, endlessly going on about things that are of no benefit to us. And the second was about speaking about things in excessive length, going on and on and on about them. Uh, and we now move on to al effort with Thalitha, inshallah, the third uh, defect, which he defines as al khawdu fil batil. al effort with Thalitha, al khawdu fil batil. Literally plunging into uh, falsehood or into vanity. Batil, the opposite of uh, haq, the opposite of truth. Khawd, plunging. And this is a Quranic term. And uh, the people of hell say, we used to plunge with the plungers. Uh, and this is said to mean uh, to plunge into idle uh, and meaningless talk. Uh, but here he defines it specifically as wahul kalamu fil ma'asi. It is to talk about sins, sinful behavior. So we might describe this third category as inappropriate talk. Like talking about the ways in which women are, and uh, sessions of wine drinking, and the uh, gatherings and the behavior of corrupt people, uh, and how rich people enjoy themselves, and the tyranny of kings and their reprehensible ceremonies, and their uh, disliked conditions. Uh, and again, here's a reminder of how contemporary all of this is and how nothing really changes. Because if you look at this list of forms of inappropriate speech, we find that that's exactly what you get on late night television. It's exactly what you get in all of those chat shows. It's exactly what those shock jocks focus on, on drive uh, by radio stations. It's exactly what fills the pages of Hello Magazine. Uh, this is exactly now as it was. Let's just list these things once again. It's exactly what you get in Hello Magazine. You'll never see anything else. Hikayati Ahwal and Nisa, talking about the way in which women are. So it's kind of fashion and who's going out with who and all of that. Wamajalis al khamr and parties in which wine is consumed. Wamaqamat al fusaq and the various uh, ways in which corrupt people behave. Watana'um al aghniya and the way in which rich people enjoy themselves. And the self-glorification of rulers and their reprehensible ceremonies. Um, that's exactly what we get, isn't it? Uh, and he says this is his third category, and it's al khawdu fil batil. That's Hello Magazine. To plunge into very graphic uh, uh, image, to plunge into what's, what's false. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ ذَلِكَ مِمَّا لَا يَحِلُّ الْخَوْضُ فِي And all of these things, uh, uh, it is unlawful to plunge into, to get involved into, to look into. وَهُوَ حَرَامٌ And it is in fact forbidden. وَأَمَّا الْكَلَامُ فِي مَا لَا يَعْنِي أو أكثر مما يعني as for uh, talking about what's none of one's business or speaking at excessive length, so his first two categories, فَهُوَ تَرْكُ الْأَوْلَى this is uh, the abandonment of what is better. 
and this in, is a kind of fiqh term, tarkul awla, means uh, not something forbidden, but something that is unfortunate because you could be some, doing something better. So instead of talking endlessly about your new car or whatever it might be, you could be doing some dhikr instead. It's, it's not haram to talk a lot at length about your new car, but it's tarkul awla. But this one, he says, this third category, um, is a category of, of the haram. But he says one can blend into the other. Naam, man yuksiru al-kalama fi ma la ya'ni la yu'manu alayhi al-khawd fi al-batil. Certainly, the person who's endlessly going on about things that are of not that are not of his concern um, is not safe from then plunging into uh, falsehood. So if you're a kind of chatterbox person and just have to keep talking and talking uh, at excessive length, you're the kind of person who's going to then find that he wants to talk about these um, reprehensible or forbidden things. Most people, when they sit around, do so in order to enjoy themselves in conversation. And their speech never goes beyond simply amusing themselves by talking about other people's you know, lack of honor or dishonorable behavior. Or plunging into what's inappropriate. He says that's what most conversation is in fact about. It's about gossip, talking about so-and-so doing something that's not right and who's going out with who and who's wearing what and all of that um, Hello Magazine gossip column stuff. And the types of this kind of false or inappropriate subject uh, cannot be uh, numbered because they are so numerous and so varied. فَلِذَلِكَ لَا مَخْلَصَ مِنْهَا إِلَّا بِالْإِقْتِصَارِ عَلَى مَا يَعْنِي مِنْ مُهِمَّاتِ الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَا And so the only way of escaping from uh, this plunging into inappropriate conversations is by making sure that one limits oneself to what is really relevant and necessary concerning the concerns of religion or one's worldly life. And then he brings some hadith. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الرجل لا يتكلم بالكلمة من رضان الله ما يظن أن تبلغ به ما بلغت فيكتب الله بها رضوانا إلى يوم القيامة وإن الرجل لا يتكلم بالكلمة من سخط الله ما يظن أن تبلغ به ما بلغت فيكتب الله عليه بها سخط سخطه إلى يوم القيامة so the Holy Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man might talk, might utter a word uh, which brings Allah's pleasure um, and cannot imagine how far that word will go. But by that word, Allah will uh, uh, be pleased with him until the day of judgment. Likewise, a man might utter a word which is angering to Allah and does not think that it will go any further, but in fact, Allah will prescribe his anger for him until the Yom Al Qiyamah, until the last day. وَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُ بِالْكَلِمَةِ يُضْحِكُ بِهَا جُلَسَاءَهُ يَهْوِي بِهَا أَبْعَدَ مِنُ الثُرَايَةِ a man might uh, utter uh, a word in order to amuse the people he's sitting with and it takes him further away than the Pleiades. In other words, he thinks he's just making something up or um, gossiping uh, just in order to please his friends, his seating, sitting companions, but it takes him far, far away. He doesn't understand the immensity of what he's doing. وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم أعظم الناس خطايا يوم القيامة أكثرهم خوضا في الباطل And he said, صلى الله عليه وسلم The people with most sins on the day of judgment will be the people who most plunged into inappropriate speech. It doesn't necessarily mean reciprocally that just in the plunging into inappropriate speech um, that's what 
multiplies your sins more than anything else. It's just that that kind of behavior, the, that the poor akhlaq, the poor state of the soul that takes pleasure in learning about gossipy things is associated with a sinful condition that will put you uh, in this category of human beings. It's the darker side of the self that wants to know um, what's, what's going on uh, and becomes kind of preoccupied with a celebrity culture. That's a very important part of really what Imam Ghazali is talking about uh, and is uh, hugely significant in, in our day. Um, what was Kate wearing at the we wedding and um, what does such and such a, a, an actress prefer in terms of the Rolls Royce that takes her to the Oscars ceremony and uh, celebrity divorces and who's going out with who and who's seeing her ex again and who's in addiction and who's looking good and who's struggling with uh, her uh, obesity, all of this stuff. Um, is exactly what uh, Imam al-Ghazali is talking about. And to be, to be the kind of person who gets off on that and is preoccupied and likes to read, and frankly it's the women's magazines often that have a lot of this stuff um, in it, somebody who's kind of preoccupied with that um, is in this uh, very reprehensible category. And Imam al-Ghazali does say um, that it is haram, and the hadith, the sound hadith says, takes you further away than, than the thuraya. Literally, you're spacing out, if you like. That's the kind of metaphor you're getting far away from how you should be and from reality. And then some Quranic ayahs. وَإِلَيْهِ الْإِشَارَةُ بِقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَكُنَّا نَخُودُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ And Allah says, uh, and we used to plunge along with those who plunged. In other words, this is uh, the um, admission of the people of the file. وَبِقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُوضُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ And he says, Ta'ala, do not sit with them until they plunge into a different conversation. وَقَالَ سَلْمَانَ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ ذُنُوبًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ كَلَامًا فِي مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ and Salman al-Farisi used to say, uh, the people on the Day of Judgment who emerge with the most sins are those who most frequently spoke about uh, disobedience to Allah and the people of sinfulness. وَقَالَ إِبْنُ السِّيرِينَ كَانَ رَجُلٌ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ يَمُرُّ بِمَجْلِسٍ لَهُمْ فَيَقُولُ لَهُمْ تَوَضَّأُوا فَإِنَّ بَعْضَ مَا تَقُولُونَ شَرٌ مِنَ الْحَدَثِ Ibn Sirin says, there used to be a man of the, the Ansar who would uh, walk by one of the assemblies and say to them, get up and do your wudu, because some of what you're saying is actually worse than breaking your wudu. فَهَذَهُ الْخَوْضُ فِي الْبَاطِلِ And it is this that constitutes plunging into falsehood, into inappropriateness. وَهُوَ وَرَاءَ مَا سَيَئْتِي مِنَ الْغِيبَةِ وَالنَّمِيمَةِ وَالْفُحْشِ وَغَيْرِهَا And it is um, something that uh, leads on to and includes uh, the other categories which we are going to proceed to speak about, including backbiting, bearing false witness, um, corruption, obscenity, and others. Yes, and he also adds here, um, oh, it's a kind of sting in the tail. ويدخل فيه أيضا الخوض في حكاية البدع والمذاهب الفاسدة. And what's included in this, this plunging into falsehood again, is to plunge into stories about heresy, bid'ah, والمذاهب الفاسدة, and false or corrupt schools of thought. In other words, it can also be gossipy behaviour endlessly to go on about what the Ismailis are doing, and what the Wahhabis are doing, and what this group is doing, and the Alavis. That's also something that the ego gets off on. And endlessly to be preoccupied with them and their sins is in the same category as being preoccupied with what um, uh, an actress is wearing at the, the Oscars. It's the same kind of part of us that is, is interested in um, uh, seek, seeking out these things. And this is, Imam Ghazali is famous for disliking the endless rehearsal and the condemnation of the, the views of heretical sects, unless you're doing it formally as your obligation to refute it as a scholar. 
but otherwise chit-chat about other sorts of Muslims is something that he really comes down very heavily on. And also, وَحِكَايَةُ مَا جَرَى مِنْ قِتَالِ الصَّحَابَةِ عَلَى وَجْهٍ يُوهِمُ الطَّعْنَ فِي بَعْضِهِمْ Also in this category is uh, to talk about the disputes amongst the Sahaba in such a way as to suggest that some of them were reprehensible. Uh, so this again would be a condemnation of the Khawarij and of the Shia because their kind of endless rehearsal of what they take to be the defects or the mistakes of some of the Sahaba again turns into a kind of gossip. What they say about Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Aisha, what the Khawarij will say about Imam Ali very quickly degenerates into a kind of nitpicking, gossipy, uh, tabloidy condemnation. And Imam al-Ghazali likes to put that in the same category as other forms of inappropriate speech. وَكُلُّ ذَلِكَ بَاطِلٌ وَالْخَوْضُ فِيهِ خَوْضٌ فِي الْبَاطِلِ نَسْأَلَ اللَّهَ حُسْنَ الْعَوْنِ بِلُطْفِهِ وَكَرَمِهِ And all of this constitutes the same thing, plunging into falsehood. Uh, and uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, to help us with his uh, generosity and uh, kindness to escape from this fault. So that's uh, the end of his treatment of the third of these defects, which is inappropriate speech, talking about haram stuff, even if you're not doing it yourself, to be interested in what such people are doing, whether it be in, in doctrine or in their personal conduct or the morality or who's in rehab or all of that. This is the category that he's talking about. Al-Afatu al-Rabi'a al-Mira'u wal jidal this is the fourth category, and all of these seem to, in subtle ways, lead on from one another. They are in a particular order. The fourth defect is uh, argument, uh, arg argumentativeness and uh, disputation. Al-mira' wal-jidal. وَذَلِكَ مَنْ هِيُّنْ عَنْ And this is forbidden. Now when we read this section, we have to think carefully, because after all, what we were saying yesterday at Fajr time is that Imam al-Ghazali is kind of <coughs> a fighter. He's the one who explains in some detail what the Arab philosophers got disastrously wrong. He's the one who refutes the Ismailis. He seems to have a book in which he refutes Christian doctrine. He has a book in which he refutes antinomian Sufis, Sufis that don't bother with the Sharia. He's really a fighter. So when we read this section, we have to realize that what he's talking about is a certain type of speech that is argumentativeness, that is from the disputatious nature of human beings, um, rather than that which comes from a dispassionate defense of, uh, of the religion of Allah and his messenger. So he says, وَذَلِكَ مَنْ هِيُّنْ عَنْ This is forbidden. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تماري أخاك ولا تمازحه ولا تعده موعدا فتخلفه The Prophet says صلى الله عليه وسلم Do not egotistically dispute with your brother and do not joke with him by telling lies and do not make a promise to him that you then fail to keep وقال عليه السلام ذر المراء فإنه لا تفهم حكمته ولا تؤمن فتنته and he said عليه السلام turn aside from uh, disputation because it's the wisdom in it is not understood and the fitna in it uh, cannot be defended against so when there is when the ego is involved in particularly religious disputation, uh, there is always um, more heat than light. Uh, the hikmah is veiled. Even if you're defending something that is true, if your ego is engaged, the wisdom of the case that you're making is lost and the fitna cannot be protected against. وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم This is a famous hadith من ترك المراء وهو محق بني له بيت في أعلى الجنة ومن ترك المراء وهو مبطل بني له بيت في ربض الجنة Whoever renounces disputatiousness even when he is right shall receive a palace in the highest part of paradise 
And whoever renounces disputatiousness when he is wrong, a house shall be built for him in the lower part of paradise. وعن أم سلمة رضي الله عنها قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن أول ما أهد إلي ما أهد إلي ربي ونهاني عن بعد عبادة الأوثان وشرب الخمر ملاحات الرجال The Holy Prophet said صلى الله عليه وسلم The first thing uh, in which my Lord took a covenant from me after um, that I should not worship idols or drink alcohol was to enter into egotistic disputation with others. وقال أيضا ما ضل قوم بعد أن هداهم الله إلا أوت الجدل. Never does a people go astray after having been guided by Allah, but that they were given disputation. In other words, this egotistic disputation, particularly in matters of religion, is a major reason why people go astray. It introduces the principle of Hawa, and hence leads people into interpretations and, as we said yesterday, theory choices that are based on the fiery might of the ego rather than on a cool and dispassionate survey of the issues. If people go astray, it tends to be as a result of polemics, disputatiousness, and you see a lot of that in internet polemic, for instance, and furious comments posted after people put up YouTube clips. Most of that is precisely this mirror. You can see the fire of people's anger at work, their own insecurities, um, their hatred, their polemic. All of that is the kind of mirror that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is, for, is forbidding and identifying as a cause of people going astray after having been guided. وَقَالَ أَيْضًا لَا يَسْتَكْمِلُ عَبْدٌ حَقِيقَةَ الْإِيمَانِ حَتَّى يَدَعَ الْمِرَاءِ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُحِقًا Allah's slave will not perfect the true nature of Iman until he has set aside disputatiousness, even if he is right. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are three qualities which, if they are present in a man, cause him to reach the true reality of Iman. Fasting in summer, or darabu a'da illahi bis saif, and striking at Allah's enemies with the sword, or ta'jilu salati, and ensuring that the prayer is done at the beginning of its time, or sabru ala al musibat, and being patient in the face of misfortunes, or isbaru al wudu'i ala al makari, and making wudu' even when it's unpleasant or inconvenient, or tarku al mira' and renouncing disputatiousness, wahuwa sadiq, even when he's right. Yes, and then there's a number of sayings here from the uh, Imams, famously Imam Malik bin Anas, rahimahullah, said, Laysa hadha al-jidal min ad-dini fi shay'i. This disputatiousness, this argumentativeness, has no place in religion. And Imam Malik was famous for falling silent or walking out of a majlis uh, if he saw people in his majlis engaging in heated uh, disputatiousness and, and argument. وَقَالَ أَيْضًا الْمِرَاءُ يُقْسِي الْقُلُوبَ وَيُورِثُ الدَّغَائِنْ And he said also, this is Imam Malik, that disputatiousness hardens the hearts and bequeaths resentments. وقال ابن أبي ليلى لا أماري صاحبي فإما أن أكذبه وإما أن أغضبه Ibn Abi Layla, famous early Qadi, used to say, I would never enter into a disputatious argument with my friend because I would either show him to be, uh, or claim that he is lying, or I would anger him.
And then somewhere he comes up with the وَقَالَ عِيسَى عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامَ مَنْ كَثُرَ كَذِبُهُ ذَهَبَ جَمَالُهُ Isa said, alayhi salam, whoever lies frequently, his beauty is taken away. وَمَنْ لَا الرِّجَالَ سَقَطَتْ مُرُوَّتُهُ And whoever disputes with other men, his manhood shall be taken away. وَمَنْ كَثُرَ هَمُّهُ سَقُمَ جِسْمُهُ And whoever is frequently stressed, his body shall become ill. وَمَنْ سَاءَ خُلُقُهُ عَذَّبَ نَفْسَهُ and whoever's character is bad punishes his own self. Okay, and now he comes up with the definition of, of mira'. وَحَدُّ الْمِرَاءِ هُوَ كُلُّ اِعْتِرَادٍ عَلَى كَلَامِ الْغَيْرِ بِإِظْهَارِ خَلَلٍ فِيهِ uh, the definition of disputatiousness is every objection to the statements of others which takes the form of manifesting a fault in them. Imma fil lafs, either in the form of their words, or imma fil ma'na, or in the actual uh, content. Wa imma fi qastil mutakillim wa Yeah, and then he says, if you're in an argument with somebody, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مُتَعَلِّقًا بِأُمُورِ الدِّينِ And the dispute has nothing to do with the affairs of religion, فَسْكُتْ Then you should be silent, anhu. وَالطَّعْنُ فِي كَلَامِ الْغَيْرِ تَارَةً يَكُونُ فِي لَفْصِهِ بِإِزْهَارِ خَلَلٍ فِيهِ مِنْ جِهَةِ النَّحْوِ أَوْ مِنْ جِهَةِ اللُّغَةِ أَوْ مِنْ جِهَةِ الْعَرَبِيَّةِ Sometimes uh, attacking somebody else's speech can take the form of uh, its form of words so that one points out to an error in grammar or syntax or the use of Arabic vocabulary أَوْ مِنْ جِهَةِ النَّظْمِ or in terms of uh, its uh, organization as poetry or prose, or pointing to defects in the way one's opponent's arguments is constructed because they put some things uh, in, in the wrong place in the argument. Uh, sometimes it can take the form of pointing out uh, uh, insufficient knowledge, sometimes by pointing out somebody's lapse of the tongue or slips of the pen. Uh, so there's, uh, this is the first of the categories that he's talking about, uh, actually attacking the form of words of your opponent. And often the ego in disputatiousness takes pleasure in finding somebody tripping over their words or failing to quote something or misquoting something. Uh, even though these things are not really relevant to whether the argument is valid or not, somebody gets a Quranic quote wrong or something in his uh, case and then you pounce on that. And it's always the ego that's doing that. That's a debating trick. Uh, and this is part of what Imam al-Ghazali is talking of when he speaks of, of Mira. Uh, and it can also be uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the meaning. And in this context, uh, This, this has much to do with Imam al-Ghazali's own inner traumas. If you recall the great uh, sort of culminating moment or the low point, I guess, of his life, if you've seen the movie, and I don't know, there might be an opportunity for them to screen it here if uh, some of you have not seen it. Uh, he was somebody who was very much part of the scholarly class of his day uh, and indeed was the lead scholar, the top professor 
in his uh, academic world, then as now an egotistic world, uh, highly competitive, in which there was endless disputatiousness. And if you won the disputes, either in writing or in various formalized uh, seminar or public debate situations, you would earn preferment, you would get a better salary, you would have more students, you would get the plum jobs. It was a world in which, uh, to the extent you could egotistically push your arguments, um, you would get material rewards. And it seems to have been this that triggered Imam Ghazali's uh, great crisis. In the middle of his lecture, he fell silent, a kind of um, uh, nervous breakdown, really. Uh, because he was wondering whether he was doing all of this just to show off to his colleagues, to show off to his students, whether the arguments that he was deploying against uh, the enemies of his madhab and of his school of kalam were in fact arguments that were based on his own uh, particular egotistic desire to be better than them, or whether they were really based on a dispassionate desire to serve the religion of Allah. And that's why this, this point is particularly important. Actually, this section on uh, Mira is the longest of these sections. And he returns to it again in the Ihya, in uh, a book towards the end, which is called Kitab Dham al Ghurur, the book of the reproach of mm, beguilement or vainglory. Ghurur is a kind of uh, proud, uh, a pride that distracts you from the truth. Uh, the ego. Uh, that takes you to hell even when you seem formally to be defending the truth. And he saw this as being a real subversion and a danger. That the mere fact of knowing that you are defending the truth can be an ego trip. And much of the Ihya, if not all of the Ihya, can be understood as an attempt to winkle out um, the demons of the ego from the souls of the ulama class of his day. He saw this as being extraordinarily subversive, that even the great khatibs and the great imams, even though they were absolutely right in their bayans, in their khutbas, in their writings, they were uh, subverted by a lack of ikhlas, by a lack of sincerity, because they were hoping for a bag of gold from the sultan. They were hoping for some kind of buzz uh, in their immediate collegial environment or even in themselves because they had won a famous victory in disputation or in lo a logical um, sequence of arguments against uh, a rival point of view. And it's very easy for the academic ego to get off on this. And one of the great merits of Imam al-Ghazali is that he's a great psychologist and uh, does not just psychologize about the masses or the merchants or whoever it might be, but he psychologizes above all uh, about his own class, about the class of ulama. And this is one reason why his books have been so loved by the ulama, because they are a very helpful way of reminding them um, of the dangers of their task. Um, that knowing that you are right is a dangerous thing. What is Imam al-Bukhari put at the very beginning of his Sahih, which is the Kitab Bad al-Wahi, the book of the beginning of Revelation, a hadith that has nothing to do with the beginning of Revelation, but it's innam al-a'mal bin niyat Actions are only by intentions. He puts that at the beginning to remind himself and to remind everybody who comes to study it and to memorize it and to learn about it and to write commentaries on it that you should not be beguiled by the fact that here you are with the greatest book of hadith about the greatest prophet that's ever lived, a great text of the greatest religion ever. Masha Allah, you're the great conveyor of this, this sacred trust. But he's saying, don't admire me for this because only Allah knows if I'm sincere or not. And that's a very Ghazalian moment in Imam al-Bukhari. It's characteristic of the, the, the hadith scholars that they remember the danger of the task that they're embarked upon. But very often we don't, and very often religious leaders are full of themselves, and they love the pomp and circumstance of riding in the Mercedes next to the head, next to the head of the, of the ministry or next to the president of the republic or whatever it might be. That's a danger for religious leaders, or they get an OBE in the British context, or whatever it is. You have to be aware of that. That's very un ghazalian to be part of that world of gongs and tokens of esteem, because um, the alim is somebody who wants to follow the truth, irrespective of whether that makes him popular or not.
And this also has uh, uh, significance for our situation as ordinary Muslims, because it's human nature, given that we're weak, to crave praise and to have arguments that are publicly respected. And when we're not praised, but we're despised, or the victims of Islamophobia, or whatever you call, choose to call it, or whether our, where our arguments are not respected, the ego is dented. And that becomes dangerous, and that can lead to aberrant behavior in our communities, or it can lead to depression, or it can lead to a determination to change the religion in order to please the people who are regarded as having opinions which matter. And all of this is subversive. But the real Muslim really doesn't care what people think. He only cares what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks. And his way to knowing what is the divine judgment is through following the consensus of the ulama. Uh, and we need to beware of this, because a lot of Muslims are upset, particularly living, living in the West. Why is it that uh, they don't love us? Mm, it doesn't, doesn't matter. And maybe it's natural that they don't love us, because they're the ones who are producing the civilization that you know, Hello magazine sells how many hundred thousand copies a week. That really is where their cultural investment is. Compare that to the religious magazines in their culture. If that's, those are their priorities, why should we be happy when they praise us? We have to be um, quite uh, realistic about this. And there are too many, you see it at David Cameron's Eid parties, for instance, all of these community leaders who are just so happy, sort of simpering, so delighted when the great man comes along and shakes their hands and very sincerely asks them who they are. And it's kind of a great moment for them. And they want to order the photograph afterwards. And this is what the Imam is talking about. Uh, and this is something that, that is death to religion. And part of the greatness of the Ghazalian interpretation and its ongoing uh, freshness is the fact that he warns his own people, his own class, his own caste himself um, about this. Okay, now towards the end of this section, there was something that I also wanted to share with you. Yeah, here he returns to the subject that he raised at the end of the preceding section. Um, which is uh, disputatiousness amongst Muslims. Uh, and here he says, ينبغي للإنسان أن يكف لسانه عن أهل القبلة. A human being ought to restrain his speech, ought to restrain his tongue from criticizing the Ahl al-Qibla. This is the most generic term that the Sharia has for people who are broadly within the, the circle of Islam. Some of them are Mubtadi'ah, some of them are who knows what, but they face the Qibla, so they deserve protection. This is what Imam al-Ghazali is saying. He's not saying that you abstain from criticizing only your own madhab. He's saying you abstain from criticizing the Ahl al-Qibla in general. وَإِذَا رَأَى مُبْتَدِعًا Okay, so what, what do you do if you see somebody who is does have a heresy? who thinks that there were 12 infallible imams, and if you don't follow them, you can't receive salvation. Or somebody who thinks that Imam Ali was an unbeliever, or somebody who thinks um, that Allah doesn't know the future, or somebody with clearly aberrant ideas, does this important principle of not disputing with uh, others um, apply because the ego might um, experience an ego trip. He says, When he sees a person of bid'ah, he gently counsels him in a private place. Hmm? This is his solution. The danger is 
the heretic is standing in front of you in the Oxford Union Debating Society and uh, the whole world is watching and there's a live stream and you really want to win the argument, otherwise the, whoever it is is going to win and you think the whole world will be misled as a result. And so the ego immediately starts to charge in and it's extremely difficult. Uh, and the Imam has come up with a number of sayings. Um, there's, there's one uh, from one of uh, from Imam Abu Hanifa, who said that the hardest form of mujah of mujahada is to abstain from making a point in a public argu uh, argument if you know that your opponent is wrong. That's the hardest thing to do. So how do you do it? Well, Imam Al Ghazali is here saying something that is unglamorous, but is very much part of the method of the ulama. You don't engage in huge public disputations, except with people who are outside the millah, uh, people who are atheists or communists or whatever it might be, dispute with them by all means. But once they're of the people of the qibla, you take them into a private place and you talattafa fi nushi. He says you gently admonish them. La bi tariq al jadal not by means of disputation. Yep. And he says that the danger of, of disputation with such people is that it tends to turn it into a contest of egos or a contest of, of tribes or groups and actually reinforces the obstinacy of the other party. By disputatiousness, the bid'ah remains and continues in his heart and is reinforced. And if finally you recognize that that counsel is not um, making any headway. What do you do? Ishtaghala bi nafsihi wa taraka. You uh, focus on improving yourself and you just leave him alone. Wa qala rahimallahu man kaffa lisanahu an ahli al-qibla. Illa bi ahsani ma yaqdiru alayh. This is a saying of one of the salaf. May Allah show his mercy to whoever uh, restrains his speech from criticizing the people of the Qibla, except according to the best method that he is capable of finding. And then another sting in the tale. وَكُلُّ مَنِ أَتَادَ الْمُجَاهَدَةِ and everybody who is used to disputatiousness and who is praised by people as a result of his debates he finds uh, that there is a kind of glory uh, and an acceptance in his soul and again, he closes on this psychological note. So anybody who's constantly disputing, he's always going on these internet forums and making his point and criticizing others. And obviously the ego is inflamed. Um, and he's very happy if he's winning a lot of these debates. Uh, he finds a, a whole range of muhlikat, destructive vices and traits, prevail in him, and he will be unable to overcome them. Uh, because he is now ruled by the sultan of anger and of pride and of ostentation and of love of status and of taking pleasure in superiority. And any one of these qualities is hard to cope with. Um, so what of the case of somebody who is suffering from all of them? 
so that's uh, category number four. Let's move on to the fifth of his defects, al-afatul khamisatul khusuma. It's a little bit difficult to put into uh, unambiguous English all of these different Arabic subtleties. Mira' Jadal, Mujahda, Mujadala, Khusuma. Um, it's somewhat awkward, so perhaps we'll leave some of them in the Arabic. Khusuma. And he does give a definition here. Wahia Aidan Madhmuma. This is also uh, detestable. Wahia Wara al Jadali wal Mira'. And it is uh, beyond disputatiousness and ostentatious debate. Fal Mira'u. Ta'anun fi kalam il ghayri bi izhari khalalin fi. Egotistic disputation is to attack somebody else's words by manifesting a defect in them. Min ghayri an yartabita bihi gharadun siwa tahqiru ghayr. With the intention being nothing but to humiliate the other person. Or is hari miziatul kiesa, and to show one's own smartness. Well, jidal and argumentativeness, ibara an amrin yata'allaqu bi izhari al madahib, is uh, an expression used for uh, giving support to one's own school of thought, wa taqririha, and uh, vindicating them. Well, khusuma, this is the third of his categories. Lujajun fil kalam il yastawfiya bihi malun aw haqqun maqsood. So he's been moving towards this. Khusuma, this is all Ghazali's definition, um, is uh, persistence in discourse in order to achieve wealth or some other desired right. Wadalika taratan yakunu ibtidaan wa tarakan taratan yakunu i'atiradan. And this, that is to say, khusuma, his third category, sometimes comes about when one begins a debate and sometimes when one responds to uh, a point made by somebody else. Whereas disputatiousness, mira, لا يكون إلا بالاعتراض على كلام سبق only takes the form of an objection to a point that somebody else has already made. فقد قالت عائشة رضي الله عنها عائشة said رضي الله عنها قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Allah's messenger said إن أبغض الرجال إلى الله الألد الخصم The most detestable of men to Allah is the stubborn disputer. وَيُقَالُوا مَا خَاصُمَ وَرَعٌ قَطٌ فِي الدِّينِ And it is said, somebody who is scrupulous in his religion never embarks on this type of disputatiousness. So this one is fairly plain, and in a sense we've already covered some of it. I should really start to move a little bit uh, faster. But this is, is very much the... Uh, point in Imam Ghazali where he's talking about uh, those who are in the paid debates of his time. Uh, Official patronage was important because the Sultan could endow madrasas and mosques and the equivalent of professorial chairs and give a major boost to one's madhab. And in order to impress the Sultan and to show that one's madhab was the true one, uh, the usual way was to embark on munazara, which was a public debate. And Imam al-Ghazali saw a lot of these and came to detest them because he saw them really as being a, a, a way in which the ulama were demoted to the status of court jesters. One day the Sultan would amuse himself and divert himself by watching his dancing girls, and the next day there would be his dwarf uh, clown uh, jester, and the next day he would bring in the muftis and watch them argue against each other and get really hot under the collar. And it's all part of a culture of, of, of just diverting the Sultan. And Imam al-Ghazali thought this was a terrible thing for religion to get involved with. He, he deplored that, and he made his famous vow in, at the tomb of Sayyidina uh, Ibrahim al-Khalil in Hebron, where he promised never again to engage with uh, rulers or with their courts. 
because he saw the lethal danger that inhered in doing religion, even true religion, uh, for the sake of amusing an essentially uh, uh, vapid and unreflective prince. He really detested that. And again, in his Kitab Dham al Ghurur, and also in the book of Ikhlas, in the Ahiya Ulam al Din, he talks about this. He really, really hates the, the way in which the, the scholars are honing their debating skills and learning various subtle debating tricks in order to poke holes in others, other, the arguments of others, or even to poke fun at them in order to win these debates, in order to get money, status, uh, preferment, patronage. And he saw this as being something that, that damaged the unity of the Muslims and was completely against the way of the, the imams. So if we move a little bit faster and take one more of these, al-afat al-sadisa, the sixth defect. At-taqa'ur fi al-kalami bit-tashadduqi wa takallu fi al-saj'i wa al-fasahati wa al-tasannu'i fi bit-tashbibati wa al-muqaddamati wa ma jarat bihi aadatu al-mutafasihin al-mudda'in al-khitaba. This is to uh, adorn one's speech with fancy words and rhyming prose and eloquent oratory and using elaborate metaphors and similes and constructions of speech and all of those tricks which are used by those who claim to be great preachers. In other words, long, booming sentences using unusual, impressive Arabic vocabulary and uh, uh, rhyming at the end of each sentence in the khutbah is rhymed and it sounds like some absolutely amazing thing, uh, like, a, like a fanfare. Uh, he says also this is one of the, uh, the faults of the tongue. If one is not speaking naturally, but is speaking as if one is some kind of amazing musical instrument, he says that this is uh, inappropriate as well. Um, all of this is uh, reprehensible artificiality. And of uh, hateful uh, superficiality. أنا وأتقياء أمتي براء من التكلف. I and the pious of my ummah are innocent of artificiality. That's in a hadith. In other words, you say things the way they are and the way you are, rather than tricking out your sentences with complicated sort of uh, trills and fanfares and de using deliberately complicated words and in fact doing the things that academics in every age like to do. People writing whole books to make a point that really could be stated in a single chapter just by endlessly going on with meaningless jargon. Sociologists generally are the worst. Inventing a whole new branch of the English language to deal with things that ultimately can't be scientifically defined because they're to do with the vagaries of human behavior. And then on the basis of this invented jargon, generating new books and new books and new books and, and creating a world that's very far from the reality of human beings. So academic prose comes into this category uh, of tasanno bil kalam. It's not just classical Arabic where the sentences rhyme and you use a lot of poetry. Modern academic prose would be uh, a good example of this. وَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ إِنَّ أَبْغَضَكُمْ إِلَيَّ وَأَبْعَضَكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا أَثَّرْثَارُونَ الْمُتَفَيْقِهُونَ الْمُتَشَدِّقُونَ فِي الْكَلَامِ and he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the most reprehensible of you to me and those who are furthest in their sitting place from me are those who uh, speak uh, in excessive length, uh, those who fill their mouths with fine phrases, uh, and those who uh, excessively adorn their speech. وقالت فاطمة رضي الله عنها قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم شرار أمة الذين غضوا بالنعيم يأكلون ألوان الطعام ويلبسون ألوان الثياب 
أو يتشدقون في الكلام. Is a hadith that Imam Ghazali likes. He uses it um, in several places in the Ihya. Uh, the worst of my ummah are those who are nourished on the finest foods, who eat uh, a wide variety of foods, uh, uh, the, and uh, those who wear all kinds of elaborate clothes and use fancy language. Yatashaddaquna fil kalam. Yep, and then he, he closes by pointing out that this does not uh, negate uh, the science of rhetoric uh, or of giving a good sermon or of celebrating the beauty and the, uh, the depth of a language. Again, with all of these things, he is saying that what counts is the attachment of the ego. The magnificent Khatib in his giant turban standing on the minbar of the Suleymaniya Mosque in Istanbul and filling that huge domed space with his own magnificent words in the most elaborate uh, form that he can construct. This is something that is not normal and it is the ego intruding. It is the Khatib attracting people's attention to himself calling them to himself rather than calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you look at the khutbas of the Holy Prophet, you can buy books just of the khutbas of the Prophet. Usually you find they're short, which is a good lesson for us nowadays. Uh, and you find that they are in very complex and subtle Arabic, very beautiful, but the ego is not attached. It's as if the Arabic language alone is speaking and that there's no ego, no sort of particular personality there. It's just the language itself, the revelation, the hadith, just that. Uh, and that's, that's a good model. So Imam Ghazali closes this by saying that sometimes uh, a rashaq, a sort of elegance in speech, is necessary in order to clinch an argument in a halal and necessary way, or in order to incline the hearts of people who are listening to a khutbah. If you use really bad colloquial, like a khutbah given in, say, um, a particularly sort of provincial form of Egyptian Arabic, isn't going to have the same effect on people's nufus as something that uses the dignity of the language and recalls uh, the nobility of speech itself. Um, so if I can just uh, end with one of my favorite uh, anecdotes, um, inevitably it's an Egyptian joke. It's about a, uh, a student who uh, goes to Al-Azhar and spends years and years there because he's been so impressed by uh, the ability of the scholars to give quite great khutbas that he wants to do it himself. So he studies there and he gets his ijazas and he gets his alimiya and then he gets all kinds of higher qualifications and he masters rhetoric and he masters oratory and he masters logic and he masters the Arabic language and Arabic poetry and it's really something. And at the end when he finally graduates he goes along to the office at the Wizarat al-Awqaf, the Minister of Ministry of Religious Affairs, and says, look, I've got all these qualifications, give me a masjid. And they look through all of their books to see what vacancies they have, and they said, well, you've come at a bad time, uh, but there is just one masjid in this furthest village in Upper Egypt, and actually they do need a khatib. And the ego of this great man is dented because he thought he was going to get one of the great mosques of Cairo, the Sultan Hassan Mosque or something, and really show people um, what, what, what he was made of. But a job is a job, so he goes off to this little dusty village in, in Upper Egypt with all the falahin, all the peasants sitting there. And the great day comes, it's Friday, and he mounts the minbar in his most splendid clothes, and it's like a khutbah is like a firework display. The most rare Arabic words and the most obscure poetic uh, quotations and commentaries, and it's amazing. And the, the peasants are kind of sitting there and listening to this, and they're kind of not, not responding very well. But he sees at the back of the, the jama'ah that there's an old man who's actually in tears. 
And so uh, at the end of the chuppah, um, he goes over to the old man and says, you know, this is just so wonderful to find in this ignorant, God-forsaken place, one man who understands the great things that I'm saying. And the man looks at him and said, well, I wasn't quite sure what you were saying, Maulana, but this morning my goat died. And when I saw your beard moving up and down, I remembered my goat. <laughs> and so I burst into tears. <laughs> so and that, that's very Ghazalian. Uh, and this again is part of the beauty of what the Imam is telling us, because the most dangerous thing in Deen is to be proud of ego, of self in Deen, rather than just to be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this, this perfect way of life and these clear and perfect aqaid which give us our bearings, our configuration, our coordinates in time and space. Our state should be humility and gratitude, not boastfulness, because it's not a religion that we invented, these Qur'ans and hadiths and all of this is not from us. We are merely the passive grateful recipients. So this should always be the state of the ones who are called to convey Allah's message in every age, and woe betide the preacher or the alim or the scholar who confuses the greatness of religion with his own self, because that's the surest way to destruction. Barakallahu fikum wa lafu minkum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. We will have in the final session, inshallah, a chance for uh, questions and answers, so save up your thoughts and objections uh, for then. Assalamu alaykum.